Moving Iron Podcast is proud to be part of the Global Ag Network. The network is going live soon, so check out globalagnetwork.com for more details and updates. Now on to the show. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Good evening and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Market Rundown with Chip Nellinger. We're now part of the Global Ag Network. So Chip, we uh, saw some activity this week with the China purchasing of stuff. Uh, they bought some soybeans. Uh, first time in a long time they've done that. Um, I mean, I guess directly anyway that they bought that. Um, wasn't as much as people were thinking, so there wasn't as much of a bang uh, as they were hoping for in the market. So what's your reaction to all that and where do you see things going? Yeah, that uh, that action uh, kind of confused a lot of people. It was just a classic buy the rumor, sell the facts. Um, you know, China we finally got the confirmation they bought beans. It ended up being uh, roughly 2.6, 2.7 million metric tons is what it looked like um, for the week. So that was far under what was talked about. Five to eight million tons was kind of what was talked about. So it was a little bit of a disappointing reaction. The market sold off uh, pretty hard on Thursday on confirmation of that. Um, you know, we had had a nice run up into that. It was pretty well uh, publicized that uh, that meeting in Argentina went well and that China was going to buy uh, U.S. ag products. Um, here's the deal, though. We don't know if they're done. Um, we had a tweet Friday from uh, President Trump that uh, things are going well. China wants a deal. They're going to buy a massive amount. Paraphrasing here, the, it's not a direct quote, but big amounts of U.S. ag products. The market's heard that story before, and uh, it, it didn't pan out, so it's a little reluctant to uh, buy into that until they know more. Uh, and then Thursday, Friday, you started getting a little more uh, of a uh, consensus in the, in the commercial grain channels and export channels uh, that China was also going to buy uh, U.S. wheat and corn. Um, we have not seen confirmation of that yet. so. Um, you know, wait and see. So we just kind of slopped sideways here. Beans uh, actually uh, went lower on the week, um, didn't close all that well, but they're still, you know, very respectable and within a, a, a big uh, uptrend channel here. So um, no damage really yet, although you don't want to see them follow through this week to the downside. Corn actually closed fairly well in the upper end of the range, um, one of the highest closes we've had in five months. We had a nice little breakout to the upside, um, pretty good export sales in wheat, in wheat this week. So we've had a lot of things going, mostly uh, most of the news has been around this China issue. And are they done buying? Are they going to buy more? Are they just starting? Are they going to buy more, including, you know, corn, wheat, pork? Um, just we got to wait and see on that. So this coming week will be, uh, I'd say by the end of the week, pretty slow. Um, you know, starting to get into the holiday mode here by the end of the week. Uh, the market, I think, is hopeful of additional confirmation of some Chinese purchases and obviously additional just, you know, super hungry for additional news as it relates to this, this trade issue. Uh, very quietly, we've seen the funds start liquidating their short positions, their, their net long corn. Um, I don't know the exact amount, 50,000 contracts. Uh, they're still short beans. They're still short wheat, but less so than they have been the last couple of weeks. So they're starting to, to uh, get into buy mode to exit those short positions that they've got left in beans and wheat. Coming in the end of the year, end of a quarter, end of a month, um, will they continue to buy and exit that position and take profits and give us a nice run into the end of the year? Um, or are we just going to kind of limp sideways here? So uh, a lot is yet to be determined in the last uh, couple of weeks of the uh, trading year here. And then you've got the holidays thrown in there, which means lighter volume. Typically, you don't do much. But now with the potential for news regarding China on a daily and hourly basis, um, that light volume can actually uh, create bigger moves than expected uh, because 
smaller amounts of volume, whether that's uh, piling on the buy or the sell side, can move the market further when there's less volume because it's holiday. So things are getting real interesting here the next couple of weeks, depending on the news flow. Okay. So a couple of news stories I want to touch on with you here. From this part of the week, there was a, a story out by Bloomberg, I believe, having to do with uh, the amount of, of hogs they were going to start culling over in uh, China, having to do with the, uh, the African swine flu deal that's going on over there. Um, basically, anything 500 head or below was going to be uh, exterminated, and then the, uh, the uh, producers over there were going to be reimbursed for that. I don't remember the exact number for that. But there was a report that they were going to start heavily exporting or importing uh, U.S. hogs into uh, into China. Have you, have you seen anything materialize out of that, or have you heard anything about that? Well, I haven't heard a whole lot. I think that's been one of the supportive factors in the hog market for uh, you know a couple months now. We're well off the lows. Uh, we're not going straight up. We've got a lot of bullishness built in here, and the market actually has put a little correction in, kind of rallied back towards the end of the week. Um, so that obviously is front and center in the hog market, and it's going to continue to be so. We've, um, especially these summer months, these deferred contracts, we've built a lot of premium in there uh, in anticipation of this. It's definitely an ongoing um, story that uh, is kind of dynamic, and you hear more and more about it every day. So uh, if we get some final confirmation, that's going to be the case. And it, I mean, it sounds like that um, that is the case. It's still hard to put your finger on exactly how many hogs that is. But um, I do think that um, that's going to continue to be supported. Does it mean we go straight up? Probably not. If we can combine that with some additional Chinese purchases of pork, um, that could really spark us. But we're going to need some things to go right, and we're going to need some announcements and confirmation of, of Chinese purchases here. But in itself, that story it continues to be supported. But you have to understand also that that's been part of the reason we've rallied. I don't know what it is to the lows, 20 bucks or more um, off the lows here three months ago uh, is this uh, swine flu issue. And this continues to be ongoing and it doesn't sound like they've got a real good handle on it. And that um, is part of the, the fix, um, I think, uh, that they hope anyway, uh, is the start of a fix there to get that under control. So it's very supportive. But with that being said, there is some of that that's already built into prices, particularly the deferred contracts. But uh, it is something that could continue to spark us uh, and continue to, to rally this market um, going forward. So it's a, it's a good thing for U.S. hog producers if they're going to uh, need to rebuild. It, it's kind of the opposite for soybean and meal demand. If they're going to be, you know, destroying animals there because of these health issues. So it's a double-edged sword there, but it's, it's certainly... Um, supportive for our hog market uh, and demand going forward, you would expect until they get built back up on numbers. Um, and it could kind of dovetail nicely with uh, this trade agreement and maybe have them in for uh, big amounts of, uh, of U.S. pork products as well. Right. So the other thing that I want to talk about, <clears throat> and you hit on a little bit earlier when we first got started, was um, so the corn and and beans and wheat even were, were even thrown out on the table uh china had well there's been articles written anyway that china has mentioned about buying u.s corn um what what would be what would be the net effect of and it all obviously revolves around the amount they buy but <clears throat> is the market going to go crazy if they show up and buy 100 metric tons of corn or i mean, I mean what, what's your what's your thoughts there yeah, the original amount kicked around was 3 million tons. Um, that's way more than they bought for several years. Right. But in the big picture, that's roughly 100 million bushels or a little right. more. That's not a big deal. If it's a one and done, you know, 3 million tons, we told you we we're going to buy some U.S. products. There's, there's 100 million bushels of corn and that's it. Um, probably not a big deal. I mean, it certainly helps, but probably not a big deal. If that's 3 million tons and they're going to do 30 million tons over the next 12 months, you know, that's the difference between uh, a 10 cent rally and a 50 cent rally or more. So we just don't know. It's such an unknown. Um, you can make an argument, though. And we've talked about this on um, podcasts before. You can make an argument and they're very out in the open with their plans, right? They want to go to a 15% ethanol blend, uh, I think, by 2020. 
2020 or 2022? I think it's 2020, actually. So they're in the process of ramping up um, their ethanol over there. There's no way that they can supply the, the, the stock, the, the grains, whether that's sorghum or corn or whatever that is, to um, supply that big of a buildup in, in ethanol. So you can really make an argument that beans, and they want to feed more DDGs, right? Supposedly we've got the best and brightest uh, feed people and nutritionists from the United States over there showing them how to modernize their um, hog feeding for the most optimum gains. And DGGs play a part of that, which is just a byproduct of their ethanol industry. So it's, I mean, I'm not super smart, but I, I can read the, the handwriting on the wall that they want to use less soybeans. They've already said that, right? They're, I mean, they're on record saying they want to reduce in a major way their soybean demand there. Um, why wouldn't uh, they want to increase the DDG side? Well, for a period of time, it, I don't think they can manage that. So it's, it's easy to make a case that whether that's U.S. ethanol, whether that's U.S. DDGs, whether that's U.S. corn, that they're maybe for the long haul here, at least for a few years, going to be um, in the market for that. And, and personally, I don't think that the market, the corn market is really ready for that. Maybe that will never come to pass. I don't know. Maybe it's just going to be 3 million tons. That's what the market seems to kind of think right now. But if we get any indication, and let's face it, they're not stupid either. They're not going to come out and tell you, yeah, we want to buy 30 million tons in the next six months because they know that prices will rally 40 or 50 cents on that news. So, right. you know, it's definitely something that's supported the corn market longer term. But it's just going to be a waiting game, right? Is it? Is it three million? First of all, we got to get the confirmation of the initial three million tons, and then you have to figure out over time is that the start of um, you know regular purchases or is that a one and done thing? But it's definitely supported. It's hard to answer your question, Casey. If it's just three three million tons, you know you probably got a ten cent rally coming. Um, if that's the start of a whole process of a much bigger amount, it's going to be really good for the corn market. Keep in mind, too, we've got this January crop report coming out. I think it's on the 9th, but don't hold me to that. I don't have my calendar up here. Um, January 9th, final crop report. We get the final yields. That's going to be really important. The trend is now for lower. So if they continue to shave, you know, whatever it is, bushel and a half, two bushels off of the corn crop um, and increase demand from Chinese corn purchases, that's just going to shrink the carryout. World carryouts are already shrinking. That's going to be get to be a friendly story in corn so it's um in my opinion the corn market's kind of taking the news a little bit relaxed and uh, it could be a much bigger story but it's going to take some confirmation of additional purchases All right okay so let's shift gears a little bit let's go down <clears throat> south america uh sounds like the growing conditions they've had so far are optimal in Brazil and Argentina, both sounds like they've had just great planting season and, and, a, and a great growing a growing year so far. Looking to have a, a, a just a huge crop sounds like in, in soybeans, uh, and those could be ready as soon as the middle of January. So, how's that playing in the marketplace now, and, and where do you see how's that going to affect what's going on with China? Because they could jump in very easily and just say, you know what, we did what we said we were going to do. We did buy some some U.S products we're going to go back to brazil and and see what we can do down there yeah i think that already is played in the market uh, exactly what you said right the big big crop coming um 122 million tons what the usda said here uh in the most recent report uh it's about the same size as some private estimates out of brazil uh big crop coming there they, it's not the bin yet they can still um go backwards a little bit from there but it it uh it's a big crop and I think that's part of the reason why the soybean market didn't do more on this news because number one, you've got a lot of unpriced beans here. Um, you've got South American farmer that, that hedges um, as well. And, um, you know, they're above the market and, and ready to sell this rally. So I think that's part of the reason we ran into a roadblock and actually ended up the week lower in the bean market um, was you know, the fact uh, that you just said that. There's plenty of beans in the world, even if they're going to keep buying U.S. beans. Yeah. So we, we don't talk about wheat much on here, so let's talk about that a little bit. You've had, you know, the ongoing saga in, in Russia and Ukraine with uh, the drought situations they had early in the year and 
are they are they not going to put an export tax on uh, the wheat that come out of that area? Uh, sounds like Australia here where they are getting ready to start harvesting their crop, um, and it sounds like they've had two or three years of pretty devastating drought. So, you know, wheat for a while was kind of the 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 one thing that was kind of propping things up and really driving the market up. What do you see with the wheat market right now, and how do you see it shaping up? Yeah, wheat finally <clears throat> is starting to do something to the upside. We'll keep going or not, I don't know. But all those issues you mentioned, we've strung two back-to-back -back, uh, really strong weeks of export sales from the United States here, um, and, and that's been supported. Um, uh, Russian wheat, Ukrainian wheat, European wheat, cash prices continue to rally. That's telling you there's not a big supply left there. There's a meeting coming up this coming week out of Russia. They're going to talk about, um, you know, and hopefully put out some news on what stocks amounts they're going to have left to export and what they're going to do there. So there's some explosiveness potentially here in the next, oh, uh, two, three months in the wheat market. Um, you know, because we've got a big supply and it doesn't look like the rest of the world has a massive amount of exportable wheat. So we may be the big beneficiary of that. <clears throat> Maybe that started the last two weeks. We've seen uh, much better exports than what we're used to. Um, some of the, you know, highest export sales that we've seen in, in many, many months, probably um, close to a year here in the last two weeks. So it's all starting um, to come together a little bit. If you throw some Chinese purchases in there, uh, the funds are short wheat. That could give us a nice little rally in the wheat market here and give producers maybe a, a chance, um, you know, sometime in the first quarter to get some uh, uh, some better hedges in place. Keep in mind also we're going to have, uh, along with that final January crop report, the final U.S. wheat plantings number. That could be pretty, pretty volatile because uh, we got super wet and cold and snowy there at, uh, and delayed planting. So we, you know, have a lot of discrepancies on exactly how much wheat was planted here uh, this fall. And so that could be an explosive uh, report as well uh, there in uh, the first uh, 10 days of January on that uh, USDA final wheat acreage number. Right. Okay, so that was my next question. So going into, uh, you know, the fall, there's all the issues that came up with the, the wheat planting cycle. And, and I was down in Kansas over the weekend here and we went, I was down south around Winfield, Udall area, uh, south of Wichita there. And there was more cotton down there than I'd ever seen ever in my life. I mean, there's cotton everywhere where there was normally either corn or soybeans or wheat or something like that. There was just corn everywhere or cotton every place. If the, um, the wheat areas that they were going to plant back, what do you think the big winter is going to be there uh, to replace those, those acres? Yeah, I think that's a debate that's going to be uh, fought out here um, until like, April or May. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, historically, once you get the January crop report out of the way, then the market starts looking ahead and debating acreage. So that wheat acreage number will be a big part of that. And uh, and I don't know. I, I think that remains to be seen. There's a wide variance of opinions on, um, number one, how many corn acres are going to be. Number two, uh, if the, those wheat acres didn't get planted, what will they go to? Cotton's in the mix, um, beans, corn. I don't know. That's a great question. I think the market has yet to fight that out, and it probably won't start fighting that out until we get that January crop report out of the way and that wheat acreage number, and then you kind of know where the playing field is and how many acres could, could swing. Um, but I think that's a great question that the market has yet to fight out and will uh, probably in the January, February, March time frame. Right on. All right, so let's bounce over to the protein complex. And it looks like, uh, you know, cattle have been not, they've been just kind of steady. They haven't really been doing a whole lot. They've been just kind of there. So what's your feelings for that? And, and where do you see, I mean, there's even been talk about the Chinese buying some beef a little bit. And there, you've seen that kind of pop up here and there. Um, what What are you hearing about that? And where do you see the, the cattle market headed this week? Yeah, you don't hear much about that. That may be more of a hope than anything uh, at this point. You haven't really heard a whole lot, um, you know, as much as you have about corn, beans, wheat, pork. Um, I think maybe it's a hope that U.S. beef could be included in that. The cash markets have been pretty firm the last couple of weeks. Um, 
you know, we've seen some nice buying, but we just can't get over that hump, right? So um, we're, we're lacking that spark, and that could be weather, that could be Chinese purchases, it could be cash market related. Um, we could definitely still see uh, three or four, maybe five dollars of upside in these uh, cattle prices, but um, it's just kind of quiet. You know, the funds I think are long. You're coming in the end of the year, unless you can see a little bit of a friendly spark. Uh, maybe this market, uh, my fear is that we maybe set back a little bit, not a lot, uh, but maybe set back just a little bit into the end of the year without a bullish spark. And that could come. It could be weather. It could be, you know, maybe it's, it's some China news. Um, maybe it's just cash market uh, explodes higher here. You, you just don't know. But the, I mean, the market, you have to listen to the market. The market is uh, up near the highs the last several weeks. And uh, that's telling me something that um, right now the path of least resistance has been um, for higher. Every break gets bought and uh, the market's just slowly grinding higher. So that's a good, uh, maybe a, a, the good makings uh, of, uh, of a potential nice year end uh, rally, especially if you get a little bit of friendly news in the equation. Right on. All right, Chip. Well, looks like we've kind of covered everything here. Kind of looked back on the week and saw what we're going to kind of look forward to the rest of the week. So if folks have a plan that they want to work on with you or they have a plan that they just want you to review, how would they do that? Yeah, the best way is just uh, call us at our office, 309-550-7213. Uh, we would love to chat with you and, uh, you know, see what you're doing currently and uh, give you some advice on uh, how you might be able to uh, improve that and execute better. Uh, lots of volatility coming. That's a good thing, but it's easy to get handcuffed with that volatility. So uh, you got to have a plan. Right on. All right, Chip. Well, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast, now part of the Global Ag Network. Till Tuesday, Chip. We'll talk to you then on Tuesday morning. Okay. Have a good start to the week. All right. You too, man. Thank you. Moving iron in the 21st century.